And what Paul says here is that we receive comfort from God through the struggles that we go through. See, we have struggles in life, challenges of everyday life, right? We, we have traffic, we have struggle, struggles at work, struggles in our families. We have all sorts of things that drag us down, that challenge us in life. We also have the struggles and the pains of sin. Our sins in, impact our lives in amazing ways, in powerful ways, and they drag us down. We also suffer losses in our life, some severe. And through these trials and struggles of life, Paul says we receive comfort from God. God comforts us in these moments. We receive comfort from God. And because we receive that comfort from God, we are then able to turn around and take the comfort that we ourselves have received and we give it to others. Good morning. Good morning. If you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and open those to Ruth chapter 1, the book of Ruth chapter 1. If you're visiting with us, we're glad you're here. We hope that you will stick around long enough for us to shake your hand and get to know a little bit more about you. I want to start off by telling you a little bit of a, my background and a little bit of my history. I grew up in part um, on my grandparents' farm down in southeastern Colorado in Baca County. Um, there on the family farm, I learned all sorts of different skills. Uh, my grandfather taught me how to drive a tractor, drive stick shift. I basically learned how to drive there on the farm. Um, hit 80 for the first time on a dirt road. Don't recommend it. Um, <laughs> learned how to shoot. I learned how to lay uh, stone and mix concrete. I learned how to garden. I learned all sorts of things out there. It's just a perfect haven for mischief and learning. Um, I love my grandparents and um, very glad that they are in my life and I'm very much here today in this spot because of the work that they did in my life. Um, in 2019 I graduated high school and I went off to AIM and my grandparents assisted in my transition to the Adventures and Missions program and I really don't know why it's such a vivid memory for me uh, but I know that they met me just north of Amarillo and we had lunch together on the road and then we carpooled all the way down to Lubbock and they helped me get settled into my apartment and uh, get all situated. And I, I know I saw them at Christmas time but I, I don't have as vivid of a memory at that point. In uh, that next uh, summer I guess I moved to New York and started working there and uh, really got involved with the church there uh, working um, in our community and getting to know everybody and had a full schedule. One day, my grandfather comes home from work and um, like he, he's been working with the county. He goes in, he checks on my grandmother. She was sick at the time, we didn't know it, but she had a brain tumor, um, so he's a little bit distracted. And then he went out and he did what he loved. Uh, he was going to do some farming. Um, so he pulls the pickup up, he fills the tractor up with diesel, and then he uh, because he's a man who gets by with very little, um, instead of buying a simple push button to start the tractor, he grabs a screwdriver and he walks over to where the starter is and he crosses the two leads like he always does to start the tractor. Well, for whatever reason, the tractor he had had all of his life, he had left in gear. And the tractor lunged forward and pinned him between the pickup and the tractor. He was knocked out instantly and died soon after. The next morning, I got an odd phone call. My grandfather had died. Completely unexpected. Um, so I got on a plane for the first time in my life and I flew to uh, Colorado Springs and learned how to process grief, how to process the sudden loss of my grandfather. Looking back I can see the fingerprints of God in some of what happened. See, I won't go into detail, but a major divorce in the family had really split the family in two. And it took my grandfather's death to bring the family back together. And I know my grandfather well enough to know that he would have gladly met his reward in heaven if it meant that his family was together again. I don't start this morning on a negative note just to bring everybody down. Um, this morning I want us to look at the book of Ruth and I have a purpose in that. I want us to learn a vital lesson 
that has to do with grief and hardship, but also that has to do with comfort. And we can't receive and we can't process the comfort unless we have the pain. In the book of Ruth, we have an interesting story. And a lot of times it becomes a love story. And there is a love story to this. But it's more a story of obedience, a story of redemption, and a story about God. And though he is not as um, out front as sometimes we we think of God in in some of the stories of the Bible. The book of uh, Ruth takes place in the time of the judges when they were in Israel. And there was a famine in the land of Judah. And a family of four left home. And they traveled to a foreign country, to Moab. And they settled there to avoid the famine, to provide for their family. But there's also an aspect of this that I want to point out that this family didn't necessarily trust God like they should have. I'm not going to say it resulted in the end of the story, but instead of trusting God and going back to God, because God said with the people of Israel, if you will trust me, if you will obey me, if you will come to me, I will bless your land. And if you will go away from me, I will strike the land. I will turn the blessing on its head and cause it to be a curse. So instead of this family turning to God and saying, we need to pursue God more, they said, we're going to do it by our own means, by our own methods. So they traveled to the land of uh, Moab. They went to Moab. And they settled there. And it wasn't long after they settled there that the father of the family passed away. I'm sure the family was set back, and it was hard. But the sons continued to provide for their mother. And they both took Moabite women as their wives, and they began to grow a family there. And they lived in the land of Moab for ten years. And then tragedy struck again, and both the sons died. Understandably, Naomi, the matriarch of the family, was grieved. She was heartbroken. She'd lost everything that was dear to her. In an attempt to provide for their family, in an attempt to provide for everything that they needed to be prosperous, they found themselves completely desolate. They lost everything. And in their grief, Naomi decides that she's going to go back to the land of Israel, back to her people. And she tells her daughter-in-laws, go back to your family. I have nothing for you. I release you from any responsibility with me. Allow me to go back to my people. You go back to your people. You go back to your gods. You go back to your family. You marry again. You have kids. Don't go with me. But Ruth, one of the daughter-in-laws, refuses to go. And she says that iconic line, where you go, I go. Your God will be my God. Your people, my people. Do not send me away. So since Ruth was steadfast in this decision, Naomi and Ruth make their way back to Israel. And that's where we pick up our reading this morning. In Ruth chapter 1, Starting in verse 19, we read this. So they both went until they came to Bethlehem. And when they had come to Bethlehem, all the city was stirring because of them. And the woman said, Is this Naomi? And she said to them, Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went out full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi? Since the Lord has witnessed against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me. So Naomi returned with Ruth, the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, who returned to her from the land of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Naomi comes back into town, and she's the talk of the town. Everyone's whispering about her. Everyone's talking about her. And they're like, really, Naomi? And she says, don't call me Naomi. Don't call me pleasant. Don't call me bountiful. Call me Mara, call me bitter, because the Lord has dealt bitterly with me. I went out full, and I've come back empty. I have nothing. Life has knocked me down, and it's kicked me while I'm down. Life has given me lemons, and I don't see how I can make lemonade out of this. And we shouldn't be too hard on Naomi. Life has dealt her a difficult hand. It's hard, and it's understandable that she is grieving and mourns and that she is bitter. Her daughter-in-law, Ruth, is going through everything and and maybe in some ways more. She's in a foreign country, surrounded by a group of people who are supposed to be separate from the people around them. And as a result, a lot of times they are ostracized. They're they're not associated with. 
So she's a foreigner in this land. She's a widow. She's lost her husband. She's dealing with a mother-in-law who is mourning. She herself is mourning. And there's no one to provide for them. So Ruth does what needs to be done. She goes out because it's barley season. And because of the way that God has designed the law that govern the nation of Israel at this time, the people who are um, widows, who are poor, who are sojourners in the land, aliens in the land, they can go and they can harvest behind the harvesters. They can pick up the leftovers, the corners of the field, that which is left and lost and dropped by the harvesters. And that's exactly what Ruth does. Now, Ruth is the talk of the town, and by providence, by happenstance, she finds herself in the field of a man named Boaz, who is a close relative. We're going to pick up our reading in Ruth chapter 2 in verse 8. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Listen to me carefully, my daughter. Do not go and glean in another field. Furthermore, do not go from this one, but stay here with my maids. Let your eyes be on the fields which they reap, and go after them. Indeed, I have commanded the servants not to touch you. And when you are thirsty, go to the water jars, drink water from what the servants have drawn. Then she fell on her face, and bowing down to the ground, she said, Why have I found favor in your sight, that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? Boaz replied to her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law after the death of your husband has been fully reported to me. And how you left your father and your mother and the land of your birth and came to the people that you did not previously know. May the Lord reward your work for, and, the, and your wages be full from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have sought refuge. Then, he, then she said, I have found favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have, in, have comforted me and have indeed spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not like one of your maidservants. Boaz is a godly man. And he has sought the Lord all of his life. And he's sought and he's reaped the benefits of that. He's prospered. He's not one of the servants. He's not even just harvesting his own field. He has servants that are able to come in and harvest the grain for him. And he comes out and he checks on the grain. He checks on the progress. And he finds out that this Ruth character is in his field. And he takes compassion upon her. He mans up and he protects her. And he instructs all of his men, you be nice to her. You treat her well. Don't rebuke her for going after grain that might be standing where we would harvest normally. Treat her kindly. And then he goes over and he begins to talk to her. And he treats her kindly and he tells her that she is more than welcome in this field. She's more than welcome to harvest here and that she will find protection here. He provides for her abundantly. And she is taken back by this. She says, why do you treat me like this? Why do you treat me well? I'm a foreigner. I'm not among your people. Why are you, why are you treating me so well? He says, everything that's been done by you has been reported to me. And I want you to know that you will find safety here. As an interesting side note, one of the things that he says to her is shalem. Shalem. Now, last week, or the week before last, we looked at the word shalom, meaning peace, comfort, blessing. Well, this is the root word of that word, shalem, meaning blessing and comfort, wholeness. So he's wishing her a form of peace, a form of wholeness. He's saying, you blessed others, and I want to bless you. I want you to be whole. I want you to be cared for. Now, don't miss what's happening here. Ruth is a foreigner. She's not a believer in God. She's not married really even into the Jewish culture. She married Jewish men, but at best they were nominal followers of God, and at worst followers of the God of the land of Moab. Now she's in a foreign land. She's not a follower of God. But Boaz, Boaz is a follower of God, and he has reaped the benefits of following God. And he's received mercy and grace and peace and comfort from God. And now Boaz is giving that comfort to Ruth. The comfort that Boaz has received by following God and obeying God, he now gives 
to Ruth. And it makes a profound impact upon her life because she says that I am now comforted. See, the people of Israel were supposed to be set apart, separate from the nations around them. And as a result, most of the Jews kept all foreigners at hand's length. They said, we don't want anything to do with you. But see, Boaz teaches us something about how we as the church, how we as a community of God's people should treat those who are not part of us. See, he keeps himself separate, but he also lends that helping hand. He gives the blessings that he himself has been given by God to somebody who has not experienced that, who needs that. He's been giving blessing. He's been given peace. He's been given comfort. Now he extends that comfort to Ruth. But the story's not over. Look at verse 19 of chapter 2. Her mother-in-law said to her, Where did you go and glean today? And where did you work? May he who took notice of you be blessed. So she took... So, yeah. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked, the name of the man with whom I work today was Boaz. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed of the Lord who has not withdrawn his kindness from the living and the dead. And again, Naomi said to her, The man is our relative. He is one of our closest relatives. Naomi, who is bitter at God, who is mourning the loss of her two sons and her husband, who feels like God is aloft, who, where God is punishing her, who really hasn't maybe taken a, a, as pursuing of a role of God. She now begins to be touched by the kindness of Boaz, not to her directly, but to Ruth. She begins to see the hands of God because of her association with God in her past. See, Boaz begins to make an impact by handing off the comfort he himself has received from God to Ruth, and that comfort then is passed on to Naomi. And then Naomi, knowing who God is and understanding the peace that comes from God, now begins to also help to bring Ruth to God because she's pointing out that this is God's hand at work. See, they begin to see the fingerprints of God, and though God is not in blazing glory in this story... He's all around because he's working through the life and the actions of Boaz. Now, the end of the story is amazing as well. If we jump over to chapter 4 of Ruth, we read this. So Boaz took Ruth, and, he, and she became his wife. And he went into her, and the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. And when the woman said to Naomi, Blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a Redeemer today. And, many, and may His name become famous in Israel. May He who also be to you a Redeemer, a restorer of life, and a sustainer in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you, and is better than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and lay him in her lap and became his nurse. And the neighborhood women gave him the name, say, uh, name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. So they named him Obed. And he is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Not only does this story work all out in the end, not only is there great blessing in the birth of this son, who then carries on the name and the line of the two sons that were lost, not only is Ruth and Naomi provided for, not only are they comforted, by the actions of Boaz. But what is even more amazing in this story is that through Boaz and Ruth, we have Obed, Jesse, and most importantly, King David, through whom we have Christ. What an amazing story we have. What an amazing story we see in our journey of seeking to discover who God is. But I don't tell you this story because there's a name that's presented here in the text. But because it's a perfect representation of a name that we see later given. Turn over, if you will, to first, or 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm going to start reading in verse 3. 
Paul says this to the Corinthian church. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all mercy and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our afflictions so that we might be able to comfort those in any afflictions with the comfort that we ourselves have received. For just as the suffering of Christ our is ours in abundance, so also our comfort is in abundance through Christ. But if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. Or if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which is effective in the patient endurance of the same suffering which we have also suffered. Paul gives God an interesting name. Theos pas paraclesis. Paraclesis. Theos pas Paraclesis, the God of all comfort. It's an interesting name. And what Paul says here is that we receive comfort from God through the struggles that we go through. See, we have struggles in life, challenges of everyday life, right? We, we have traffic, we have struggle, struggles at work, struggles in our families. We have all sorts of things that drag us down, that challenge us in life. We also have the struggles and the pains of sin. Our sins impact our lives in amazing ways, in powerful ways, and they drag us down. We also suffer losses in our life, some severe. And through these trials and struggles of life, Paul says we receive comfort from God. God comforts us in these moments. We receive comfort from God. And because we receive that comfort from God, we are then able to turn around and take the comfort that we ourselves have received and we give it to others. It's not a limited supply. I receive a dollar, therefore I give a dollar. I receive and then I have nothing. No, instead I receive and I give and I still have. And I have an abundance and I give an abundance because God is given in abundance. See, Boaz had received from God. He had followed God. He had been blessed by God. And through the blessings that he had received from God, through the interactions that he had had with God, he was able to turn around and to bless Ruth and Naomi. And through the blessings that he poured out on them, he comforted them in their trial. And he brought them to the Lord. He brought them back to God. And in doing so, he blessed not only them, but the entire nation of Israel. Because, see, we are given comfort by God. And we are then able to turn around and to comfort others. See, Christ was willing to come down to earth, live among us, go through all the pains and the struggles and the trials of this world, and to die for us so that we might be comforted in our sin, forgiven of our sin, and brought into the family of God. We who were once far off, who were strangers, who were aliens, have now become a holy priesthood of God's elect people. And that's what God is calling us to do. He is calling us to be a people of comfort because He is a God of comfort. And we give the comfort that He Himself has received. And though we, know, we don't see in the story of Ruth or in the story of the Corinthian church necessarily God showing up in wonders and miracles and miraculous signs and through prophets, we see God in the daily interaction of His people sharing the comfort they themselves have received with others and making a profound impact on the lives of those around them. So how do we take this and apply it to our lives? Well, first off, I think we praise and worship a God such as this. A God who is comforting us. A God who is willing to suffer in our stead. A God who is right there with us in all the pains and the struggles of life. We should worship such a God and praise Him. We should praise Him during the storms. We should praise Him during the good times. And we should comfort others. That's the other thing we have to do in this. We have to take the comfort that we ourselves receive and we need to give it freely to those around us, comforting them and their afflictions because we've been there. See, we need to begin to use the pains and the trials in our lives as a stepping off point to connect with people around us, to minister to those around us, and to share the comfort that we ourselves have received. I love my grandfather. I love the life that he lived before me. I wish he was here. I wish Alyssa had gotten to meet him. But I learned valuable lessons through his passing. And I now can 
empathize with those around me. I can now minister from a place that I couldn't have ministered otherwise. See, we give the comfort that we ourselves have received. Here in a minute, we're going to stand and sing. And if you need the comfort of the church, if you're struggling with something and you would like us to pray with you and help you through those struggles, we invite you to come. If you haven't received Christ into your life, if you have not committed your life to Him, you can do two, one of two things. You can come and you can be baptized into Christ and you can wash away your sins and you can die yourself and you can begin that new life of comfort in Him. Or if you don't feel like you're ready to make that commitment, either now or later you can get with me or one of the elders or another member that you trust. We can set up a Bible study with you and we can answer the questions that you might have. Before we stand and sing, though, I want to leave with the words of the Hebrew writer out of Hebrews 13. He says this, Now may the God of peace, who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in all good things to do His will, working in that which is pleasing in His sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.